this particular verse or this um, story from the Bible, which I'd like to share with each and every one of us this morning. Um, it's called Moses and the Burning Bush. Bring back memories of Sunday school and, yeah, it's growing up as a kid, right? So we all know who Moses is. We know the encounter that he had with God, the burning bush. So let's turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, and verses 1 to 3, the word of God says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Verse 3, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. We know Moses came, he had an encounter with his fire, and he made a decision to turn around, to look, and to see this great sight. But backtrack, how did Moses get to this stage in the first place? Now you gotta help me out, give me some some facts about Moses that you know of. He murdered. Say something nice about him. <laughs> 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 he fled. He fled from Egypt. Okay, he yeah. He broke Jethro's flocks for 40 years. Oh, can I guess you're preaching my message? <laughs> <laughs> what else about Moses? He was pulled from the reed. Very good. That was one. What else? He was a leader. He was a leader. Broke the palace. Broke, yes, 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 dear? Raised by Pharaoh. Raised by Pharaoh. He was educated. He was educated. So many things about Pharaoh, and I'm not trying to insult your intelligence of the story of Moses and the burning bush, but we know all of those are true about Moses. Of course, he was an Israelite, but then, you know, because when the word came out that all the first wanted to die, you know, they had to spare him. His parents decided to send him away, and of course, got adopted, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, and became a prince in Egypt, and on and on and on and on, until, of course, he decided to commit murder, right? So let's look at this story. We'll go bit by bit here. If you have any questions, you can ask my husband. <laughs> Hebrews, uh, Exodus chapter 2 and verses 10 to 14, we'll look at this account of, of Moses' life. In chapter uh, 2 verse 10, it says, As a child grew, this is Moses, and she brought him up, and she brought him up to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew thee out, I drew him out of the water. Verse 11, And he came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, then he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews drove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smites thou thy shadow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me, as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. In this account, we see Moses' upbringing. By Egyptian standards, Moses was a prince, because he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So he was royalty, right? Even though he was an Israelite or Hebrew, he was adopted into that priestly kingdom. So he was a royalty. Well, he was royalty. He was a prince. Adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. And he grew up in the palace. He lived among royalty. Another thing about him, whatever 
his brethren went through, the Hebrew, the Israelites went through, Moses never went through. Because although he was uh, an Israelite by birth, he was actually raised as an Egyptian. So he never experienced any of the troubles that his fellow Israelites were experiencing at the time. So that was his upbringing as a royal in the Egyptian kingdom. In the same passage, we see here comes his downfall, the slaying of the Egyptian. Now, why do you think he did that? Why, why, why do you think he did that? saving his Hebrew brother's life. He realized that. And he was doing that. He was trying to save his brother. And so he decided to, well, I'm going to teach this Egyptian a lesson. Because, like you said, Susan, he wanted that, to identify with them. He wanted that acceptance. He wanted to belong to them. However, his action to defend the Israelites, although what, it was what Moses saw as you know, a good deed. It, it was a right. I'm actually protecting um, my fellow Israelite from, from being murdered. He saw it as a good thing. But that was the day. That was the cause of his downfall. Which brings us to the third point that it says, we become, oftentimes, just like Moses, we become victims of our own actions. Actions that are done out of the flesh. Spur of the moment, what we feel, we think, then we tend to jump into it. And oftentimes, we end up suffering. We end up becoming the victims of our own actions. And, you know, of all people, the Israelites, we would have thought, oh, maybe they would have jumped for joy. Yay, Moses saved us. But instead, what happened to him? He was faced with rejection. Now he's stretched. Transgression was brought to light. Mind you, he buried it. The Egyptian probably tossed some sand over him. Didn't even bury him, so that didn't even come to light, right? You don't bury people with sand. I mean, you don't just put them in with the sand over them. You actually have to dig a pit. Moses didn't do that. He just put them under the sand. And probably think it would go away. And it came to Pharaoh's attention. Moses is still an Egyptian. This Moses, whom you raised in the, uh, in the palace, who you've given a status and accepted as a prince in this kingdom, has now slain an Egyptian, one of your own men. So all of those actions, that, that, that very action which Moses saw as a good deed, was his downfall. It made him face rejection. It, of course, brought things to light. Once upon a time he was loved, now he became the enemy. Saying all of this to say that with Moses' good intent to save the Israelites, he lost everything. Just like that. His status as a prince, his authority to rule, his place in society, or among the Egyptians and the Israelites at the time. The Israelites didn't want him, neither did the Egyptians want him. So now he was, he didn't have any place to belong. Why are we sharing all of this? And again, when we look at the story of Moses, we can see it from so many angles. And you can interpret it in your own, you know, you can have your own revelation about what this story means to you or what you can learn from it. But this is what I want to share with us this morning and what the Lord has been really pressing upon my heart. The focus of today, we'd like to look at, it's not a good, it's kind of like disheartening to say, but the losses we end up with when we decide to take matters into our own hands. How this part, right? <laughs> we'll get the good part later. But before Moses came to see this burning bush, he went through a time of 
lost. And as we saw in Exodus chapter 2, verses 10 to 14, it gave us an account, uh, it gave us an account of how Moses, you know, in his intention to save, lost everything. And from the story of Moses, we can often see that the actions or our reaction in the flesh of what we think is right, of our feelings, of the words that we speak at times, when used out of the flesh, can have very adverse effects on our spiritual lives. I repeat, it can have very, very adverse effects on our spiritual lives. One of the things it affects, first thing, it affects our identity. Turn with me to Revelations chapter 1 and verse 6. I'm swiping. <laughs> Revelations 1 verse 6 says that and made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. He has made us to be kings and priests unto God and to his Father. What a great calling, eh? For each and every one of us sitting in this room this morning, God looks at you and says, I have made you a king. I have made you a priest. That's very high, that's high status, that's high ranking. And that's exactly our identity. That's how God looks at us. God doesn't look at, look at us as insignificant beings. He looks at us as royalty. Amen? Amen. And here in Revelation 1, it says, And it made us kings and priests unto God. That's our identity right there. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Again, a royal priesthood. Royalty is our identity. And that was exactly what Moses had. Raised in the, uh, in the Egyptian palace, he was given a status of a prince. He had that identity. However, Moses lost his royalty status the moment he decided to take matters into his own hands. How? By slaying the Egyptian. And of course, you know, we, you can argue from all angles, like, oh yeah, he, he was right to do that because this person was so on and so forth. Yeah, of course, it, and he was right. He had a right to do that. But actually, that was the spur of the moment reaction. And what happened? That good deed of saving this Israelite was actually Moses' downfall. He was taking his own grave. And this often becomes our experiences, especially when we take matters out of God's hands. When we allow our flesh to start dominating the way we think, and start dominating the way we speak, and our responses, our words, that happens to us the moment we start reacting in the flesh. And one thing I'm reminded of often, when you look at our hands, and you look at the hands of God, what's the difference? If I'm boring you, I'm going to say, let's all stand up and sing. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> How big, what's the difference between our hands and God's hands? Size. 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 Our hands are bigger, right? <laughs> God's hands are big. Yeah. And they're so big that the Bible describes even this entire earth sits in it. So at times, God's hands are so big, but we with our teeny little hands, stubby fingers, we like to go and take matters out of God's hands. Say, so I'm going to take care of it. I'll slay the Egyptian. What happens to us? It becomes our downfall. Because there are certain things that we cannot handle when we try to handle them in the flesh. Amen? Yeah. Think, for instance, how do you feel? after you've had a very heated argument with your spouse, or your child, or your family member, and you've told him you've called every name under the sun, and you've cursed them, you sent them to hell, how do 
you feel after that? Oh, are we so spiritual here, man? <laughs> feel awful. You feel like crap. Man, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's how we feel, no? Yeah. Yeah. When we react to the flesh, it leaves an aftertaste in our mouth. Taste of guilt and of shame, of condemnation. And you're like, oh, you didn't really say that. You know? And the enemy, he has a heyday. Like I've done it again. I loaded the gun, I put it in her hand, and she fired the shots, and she killed me. <laughs> and so we feel so down. And do you feel like royalty at that time? Yeah. Come on. We don't. We lose that identity. And that was exactly what happened to Moses. You know, he came up prancing and walking around like this, this mighty Egyptian prince. Hey, you. I'm going to, and, and kills him. And the next minute, you know, what happened? All of that is gone. That strength, that authority. Is gone. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 25. Here it says, I shouldn't read too many verses because everyone's real just going to sleep and I'm just kidding. It's good. Oh, okay, there we go. I have like a hundred verses to read. Go, girl. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 25. I was pre warned by my. Has been not to joke too much, so we can be saved. Second Samuel two verse twenty-five. Second Samuel chapter two verse twenty-five. You know what the the dark this is what technology does to you. It actually makes you forget how to fit. <laughs> so Second Samuel chapter two verse twenty-five. Here it says. And the children of Benjamin, no, actually, not the wrong verse. What does it say how the mighty is full? Anyhow, long story short, he'll give you the answer. It says, when David came, he wept over Saul and um, Jonathan, his son. One of the things Jonathan, he said was, how about the mighty power? And who was Jonathan and, and, and um, Saul? Saul was a king. Jonathan, his son, was a prince. One twenty-five. Ah, second, thank you. Second Samuel 125. Here it says. No, it doesn't say. Yes. Oh. Okay, can somebody read for me, please? Same time. Second Samuel 125. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? For Jonathan Valley slain the one high priest. Right. So here, this is David lamenting over uh, Saul and Jonathan. And he's saying, how are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? This means that even though we, you and I, were called to be kings and priests unto God, we are not exempted from falling and failing, despite that status as royalty. And, you know, you probably may say, well, that's the old covenant. But there's some element of truth there. Because we lose that status the moment we give into our flesh. When we operate in the flesh, that status stays taken. It's almost like we lose it. We don't feel like overcomers anymore. We don't feel like we, we rule and reign. Instead, we feel defeated. That's the loss of status right there, or our identity. So David lamented so with Samuel, uh, Saul, and, and Jonathan. He says, how would a mighty fall in the midst of the battle? So children of God, even though we may have this identity as sons and daughters, as, as, as royalty, if we're not careful to live in the spirit, to react according to how be led of the spirit of God, there is, there, it's very easy to lose that identity. Another thing that happens to us when we react in the spirit, uh, out of the flesh, we lose our authority. We look at the case of Moses. After he slew the Egyptian, he went out to see his brethren. Again, going back to Exodus chapter 2, verse 14. Now he comes walking down the next day. He sees his brethren fighting. And he says, And he went out the second day. Behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Where was Moses? Smite thou thy fellow. 
Verse 14. And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Right then and there, Moses lost his respect. His authority was questioned by the people that he wanted to save the previous day. What does that speak to us about? It means, what it shows us here is that sometimes in our intention to save, we lose the respect of other people. And it's not, I'm not saying this from a place of us wanting to be recognized or anything like that, but when people start to question your authority, it makes you second guess yourself, eh? Like Reuben often shares on this deliverance session that um, you know, he asked one of the ministers to get up and um, cast out the devil. And as soon as this young minister stood up to put the demon out, the demon, you know, this person was knocked out on the floor, but quickly rose up and said, who do you think you are? You're fearful. See, Moses, having re the reaction in our flesh makes us become weak. That even though we may have the status, like Moses still was known as the prince of Egypt, but he no longer had the authority to rule. He no longer had the authority to command and respect. Because his very own brethren asked him, who made you a prince? Who made you a judge over us? And this often reminds, this reminds me of this uh, verse in Matthew chapter 7 where it says in verse 3, Why be all this doubt and moth that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the deed that is in thy own eye? Oftentimes there's a tendency to look at what people have, their mistakes, their faults, their failures, and we start to pick and choose and pull and pluck and try to fix. And we forget that we have a bigger beam in our eye. You know what that happens? It makes us lose our authority. Because we were doing the same thing. Moses did the same thing the very previous day. And now he wants to come and save. So be very careful as children of God. Be on the guard that the enemy, not to live in fear, but be smart. The enemy knows how to attack us. He knows how to make us start to question our authority. Because especially when there's a reaction in the flesh, oftentimes we tend to forget that hey, we, we, we just did this the other day. And now I want to correct this person, or I want to do so and so. Nonetheless, Again, when we look at this, um, when Moses lost his authority, of course, when he was questioned about his authority, something happened to him right there. Can anyone guess? According to verse 14. What happened? He was afraid. Exactly. It says, it says here in verse 14, and Moses feared. This was a prince. This was a warrior. Historically, I can't remember where, if, if it's in the Bible, it's in the history book I read. Moses had conquered the entire East Africa, as well as some parts of India, for his mother. He was a mighty warrior. Not in the Bible. Not, okay, right. I probably should find a link. Maybe imagining it. But I remember reading it somewhere. Anyhow, um, Sean probably scrapped that. <laughs> Anyhow, he was a prince, and he had his authority. But now, after his authority was questioned, the word of God says, he feared. Moses feared. Fear is a sign of weakness. As in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, for God has not given us but power of love and of a sound mind. But saints of God, whenever our authority is questioned, oftentimes it's very easy for fear to set in. And we start to question ourselves. Do I really have that power to overcome? Did I really hear God say this? So there is a tendency, and the enemy loves to do that. But you know, he can only do that when we operate in the flesh. When we operate in the flesh, we give him this they say you give him an inch, it takes a mile. And so he tends to question us. He makes us question our authority. Oh, I don't know if I can trust God for my finances. Oh, I don't know if I can trust God for my healing. So often all those questions start to come to us because, you know, maybe because we reacted in the flesh and it opened the door for the enemy to start questioning our authority. 
and then he makes us become weak. Instead of having the power to overcome, we become weak. Instead of having that love, we find ourselves being bitter. Instead of having a sound mind, we find ourselves confused and troubled and double-minded. Those are all the, the traits, the negative traits that set into our lives the moment we decide to take matters into our own hands. Another thing that happens to us, number three, actually the seven points is uh, point number three here. It says, when we react to the flesh, just like Moses, in Exodus chapter two, verse 15, when, when Moses heard about you know, his brethren questioning his authority, he was afraid. Why? Because not, most, uh, not Pharaoh heard about this thing. He heard that Moses had slain an Egyptian. So we become targets of attack. Now backtrack. Moses' intention of saving this, the, the, the slain Egyptian wasn't for bad. He wanted to save his fellow Hebrew. But now Moses becomes the target of attack. How could it be fair? The same thing happens to us also. Our flesh will make us feel like, yes, this is the right thing to say, this is the right thing to do, you should do this. And next minute, you know, we're getting attacked and we wonder why the devil doesn't beat us. It says you go to bed with fleas, you wake up with what? You wake up with fleas, right? So Pharaoh, uh, Moses, when he heard this thing, when he heard about Pharaoh coming after him to slay him, he was not a target. And mind you, Pharaoh could have easily slain every Israelite slave right there to, to take revenge or to compensate for this one Egyptian that was slain. But he didn't go after them. Who did he go after? He went after Moses. Because the Israelites, they were already slaves. So they didn't have any worth. They didn't have any value. But Moses had worth. Moses had value. He was a royalty. He was a prince. But he decided to stay an Egyptian. He becomes a target of attack. Saints of God, many of us experience this on a daily basis. And oftentimes we don't even want, we don't even realize. It may have been that little bit of that inch that I gave to this flesh that has maybe become a target of attack. Moses had lost all of his dignity the moment he decided to slay the Egyptian. He lost his status. He lost his authority, he became fearful, and now he's on the run. He becomes a target of attack. The same technique that Moses used against his Egyptian was the same technique that, Moses, that Pharaoh was planning to use against him. Moses slayed an Egyptian and says in the word of God, the Pharaoh decided, I am going to slay Moses too. Sometimes, when we go through life, we react to the flesh, don't be surprised at the very thing, like they often say, you have a taste of your own medicine. Sometimes we dish out things, not realizing that when it hits us, how do we react? Well, often they say, you know, what goes around comes around, right? So the same technique that Moses was used to slay the Egyptian, Pharaoh said, I am going to slay you too. So saying all of this not to scare us and make us feel weak and feel like a coward, but help us to be on the guard. I don't need this. I don't have to be a tar target of attack. The enemy has to be afraid of me, not be afraid of me, in the enemy, Amen. right? Moses, he was this prince, he had his royalty and his status. Now, he became the target of attack. Although he decided that his intentions were good, it only, like he said earlier, he was digging his own grave. Now his life was in danger. So oftentimes, our, out of ignorance, our actions can set us up to become targets for the enemy to attack. And sometimes, you know, you're like, why can't this thing leave me? For instance, somebody offends us. And we decide to hold on to that bitterness or that unforgiveness. Do you know what you're doing to yourself? The word of God says, unforgiveness is like a prison. We put ourselves in that prison. And if you've ever been to a prison cell, you know it's not big. It's very tiny. There's not enough space to move around. So likewise, an example, when we have bitterness or unforgiveness, it keeps us in that prison, in that space. And we wonder why we can never be free, why we can never prosper, why we can never go forward, why we're always attacked and tormented. 
I remember that one of our first um, deliverance sessions that we had in Carmody, where did a young lady come, and she was a teenager, and she came and she was having so much trouble sleeping at night because she was constantly under attack and tormented and nightmares and you know almost like she, she was being literally choked in her sleep. And so she came and so we sat down with her and we decided to minister to her and you know ask the different questions. And she couldn't think of anything she did wrong. All of a sudden it, it occurred, it, you know, the Holy Spirit said, ask you if she had some form of unforgiveness. And sure enough, when we just asked that, this, this demon manifested itself. And she wanted to kill, choke herself. And the reason was because the mom pushed her and she decided to hold it against her mom. Allowing her mom to be rent free in their head, eh? See, that's how the devil likes to make us. He makes us become victims. He makes us think, hold a grudge against this person, you know, and let them feel it. Give them the cold shoulder. But you know what we're actually doing to ourselves? We're putting ourselves in the cage. And we're never going forward. We're still in the same place, year after year. That's why we're always looking out for everybody. God, revive me, revive me. You have life in you, child of God. Let that unforgiveness go. Let that bitterness go. It's a prison. And we wonder why we're so tormented. This young lady says, I can't sleep at night. I'm tormented. It's like this thing keeps choking me. And it was because of that unforgiveness. And she may have had a good reason to have probably held it against the mom because she was hurt. The mom pushed her. But not in God's word. God says forgive. Amen? Amen. Another thing you see about Moses, now he's, he's the target of attack. The next thing we see about him, and it happens to us, we resort to running away. We run from everything. By the way, I love this one. Sean was saying this morning, they were powerful. About turning, about looking to the face of Jesus. Here Moses, we see, starting to run away. Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. The moment he had Pharaoh's, heard Pharaoh was up in his life, it says, Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh. Hello. James chapter 4, verse 7. Who knows it offhand? You're excluded. <laughs> okay. Very good. It says, you submit to the Lord, you resist the devil, and he will <coughs> not us run from him. He has to run from us. <coughs> However, here we see Moses running from Pharaoh. I mean, of course, yes, he has every right to run because he was afraid of his life. His life was in danger. He was on the line. He was going to be executed. He was going to be killed. So on and so forth. And, you know, we can really blame Moses because he tried to save this uh, Israelite. And, you know, poor Moses. But you know what it made to him? Now his resort from every problem was run. You know, this. I think this, this YouTube prank thing, they have a, a music called run, and then everybody said running. That was how Moses was reacting. Every little thing made him run. Not every little thing. He fled from home now, from Pharaoh. Because his life was in danger. He was the target of attack. But in James chapter 4, verse 7, he clearly says we submit to God. We resist the enemy. And he should flee from us. Not us running from him. He flees from us. Amen? Amen. Because we have royalty. We command that authority. Now don't let the second guess yourself. You have it in you. Amen? Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. Mind you, this uh, resists the devil and he will flee from you. I have a lot of stories to tell, but I don't want to share a lot of them. But one particular instance, again, we were praying for someone, and as we were in our ministry to this person, you know, Ruben said to command me, uh, he was just praising God, not actually studying deliverance yet. Praising God. And so the demon says, Who do you think you are? And Ruben said, Oh, I'm just praising God, you know, child of God. And this demon was mad. And Ruben said, Oh, well, you're, you're but a flea. Oh, I am not a flea. This demon was offended. He was offended. Because now he was known as a flea. But he couldn't take it. See? But this is exactly what
what the enemy is doing to, what does to us whenever we react to the flesh. It makes us run. It makes us feel like we're going to fleas with the egg. You know what fleas do? They're constantly jumping. They don't have any wings to fly, but they're jumping from, from one dog to the next dog to the cat and stuff. And they're constantly feeding off the people and pussing on whatever toxin. And that's what happened to us also when we give an inch to the flesh. We react in the flesh. Our only resort uh, for any problem now would be to run from it instead of facing it. Instead of, of, of using the power that's within us, you know, we, we, we have already lost that identity. We start to question our authority, and the next thing we do, we start running. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you, excuse me, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to... Yeah. Oh, I was going to say run. <laughs> you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to... Yeah. Very good. I wish I had that music because I would run. But it says, having done all to stand. God has called us to stand. He did not call us to run. And I remember one man of God said, um, you know when God made the armor, of, you know, the whole armor of God? Do you ever notice? Did he have a covering for the back? No. <laughs> Very good. He didn't have a covering for the back. Why? Well, we're not supposed to run. It's covered in the front. Which means that shield is so that we can go forward. So there's no covering for the back. You turn around and run, you're dead. Right? So here it says, take the whole armor of God and, with, and to be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand. The sad thing is, despite that armor of God that's given to us freely, we don't have to pay for it, you don't have to travel to, um, you know, some holy land to get that armor, or if they have it in a museum or something. You don't have to go there. You have it in you. It's right there in scripture. <coughs> says God says to stand. But here the enemy makes us run. But God says, I've called you to stand. And I've given you everything that you need to be able to stand, to resist, and not to run. Yeah. So mind you, if you're thinking of running, and you're wondering why you're getting stabbed in the back, just know that there's nothing to cover your back. The next thing that happened to Moses, now he was running, of course, that he resorted to running, and guess where he ran to? Where did he run to? Hey, you should know the story of Moses. Median. To Median. He ran to Median. <clears throat> I don't know if he was planning to run to Median, but anyway, he ended up in Median. You know what the meaning, meaning of the Hebrew meaning of for Median is? It means strife. Hallelujah. From the fright then into the fire. He ran right into that land of strife. James 3.16 says, For where ending and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Moses, out of his good intentions to save, operated in the flesh, became a target of attack, ran for his life, ran straight into meeting. Place full of strife. Although the Bible doesn't give any description of any specific incidences of strife or anything like that. There was one when he decided to, you know, defend the Jethro's daughters. That was one. There, there was probably a tiny minor. Those shepherds didn't want to share the water or the well. But there was one part when he went into strife. And here in James 3.16 it says, For well, where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil word. So when we're living in strife, we're unable to enjoy peace and tranquility. Because there's always, there's always this tug of war. You pull, I pull. And we're unable to enjoy the peace, the rest. Because we're surrounded with that strife. It says, where there is strife, there will always be confusion. There will always be an uh, evil work. Another feature of these Midianites, they had a very nomadic lifestyle. And nomads are usually shepherds, people who take care of sheep, but they're always on the, on the go, as, go as in um, move. They're always moving from pasture to pasture, field to field, looking for places to feed their sheep. So wherever they find a good place, they'll set camp for that night, and then they'll move on. This nomadic lifestyle can speak of an unstable life. James chapter 1 verse 7 says, a double-minded man is unstable 
in all of his ways. So when we're living in, living in Median, we're living in that place of strife, it, it, it takes a toll on our state of mind. We start to become confused. We start to become double-minded. We start to question, we start to doubt. So all of those things didn't have to happen to Moses, but it happened to Moses when he decided to take matters into his own hands. And in the same way, we often experience that also when we take matters into our hands. A sound mind prevents us from being double-minded. But being a, a, being a double-minded person makes us become unstable. We aren't able to enjoy God. Today we're up on the mountain, tomorrow we're down in the valley. And we need somebody to come and bail us out. One of the, one um, example of Moses, and of course, you know, the, the question is, did these negative traits have an effect on Moses when he was leaving in Midian? Anyone guess? Do you think? Any specific um, example you can think of? I'll tell you one. If you look in Acts chapter 7 and verse 22, Acts 11, um, sorry, Acts 7, verse 22. I'll finish shortly. Acts 7, 22. Look here, it says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. That was Moses' academic ability. He was intelligent. He was eloquent. He was well versed in the Egyptian culture. This man was smart, he was intelligent. But you know what happened to him living in Midian? What made him? In Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, he says, Oh Lord, I am not eloquent, but slow of speech, and of a slow tongue. All the potentials and the abilities that he once had, he didn't have them anymore. He started to second guess himself. Can I really speak? God saw that he could speak, God saw his potential, but he couldn't see it. Even though he had this, uh, he was educated in all the wisdom of Egypt, but here Moses couldn't see that now. He's like, oh, I can't speak. So finally God had to say, well, bring your brother Aaron, right? So this is what happens to us when we live in strife. There'll always be this confusion. There'll always be this, every evil word, that we're unstable, we're double-minded, we start to second-guess ourselves. But the good news is, child of God, God doesn't see you as that. God sees your potentials. He sees your worth. He sees you as an overcomer. He sees you as a ruler, one who has authority. And God, but yet, you know what? God never gave up on him. Thanks be to God, you know? He never said, okay, well, let's call, let's call it quits because you can't even speak. God didn't see that. He overlooked all of those things. Whilst in that living in that strife, another thing that happens to us, we start to experience what they call an emotion. Meaning, everything that we had, we just start to lose. That was what happened to Moses. Once upon a time, he was this prince in Egypt that had all the wealth of Egypt. Now what happens to him? Gen uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, the beginning of that verse says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father in law Where was the devotion? That's the opposite of promotion. From a prince, he became a shepherd. And here it says he kept the flock of his father in law. It wasn't even his sheep. They belonged to his father. He was probably penniless. But, you know, and he was just tending sheep, his father in laws. So all the position and wealth and status that he had was all taken away from him because of that one serious state. And then another thing, he lost his leadership skills. Once upon a time, he commanded authority. But after he was questioned about his leadership and his authority, what was the only thing he could lead now? Uh. <laughs> Very good. The only thing he could lead was sheep. Sheep. That was the only thing. I mean, bless the sheep. Thank God for them. That's why we have clothes. Good. But Moses, he lost the leadership. He could no longer lead. 
Now the only people that wouldn't question his authority, well, you know, that's right, Brad said that the sheep do say blah, but you know, at least you can't really translate or in, in, interpret exactly what they're saying. But nonetheless, at least he had some form of authority, but he was on a lower scale. But here we see more, he lost that, that leadership authority. Exodus 3 verse 1 said, and not only losing that, uh, leading the sheep, Exodus 3 verse 1 said, he left the sheep or the flock so what part of the desert? Huh? The back side. The back side of the desert. Now what do you think about that? Back side of the desert. The back side of the desert could signify the inability to move forward. Instead of going forward, we tend to go back. And sad to say, we can easily lead, lead, lead people back as well. Backside of the desert could also speak of hiding. Instead of coming out to the light, we're hiding. Because we're afraid of what people may say or what our actions have done. We're afraid of the, the, those negative consequences. So we're constantly dwelling in the backside of the desert. But you know what? In all of that hiding, this is the meat. Point number seven says Moses came to the mountain of God, where he saw the burning bush. So in spite of everything that he had gone through and everything that he had lost, despite leading sheep and going to the backside of the desert, he came to the mountain of God. Psalms 139 verse seven. It says, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I have set up into the mountain, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Amen? God met Moses even in the backside of the desert. He caught his attention with that burning bush. Moses turned and he saw this bush that burned with fire. And one thing he noticed, he said, that's strange. That bush is not burnt. Now we know that fire has a very destructive nature. It consumes, it burns. But one thing about this flame that Moses saw, it said it was burning in that bush but the bush was not consumed. And child of God, that fire wasn't a fiery judgment. It was a fire of sanctification. It was meant to sanctify Moses, to help Moses, to put back Moses back on the right track. Then, if you read further on, it says, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. He did not wait for somebody to tell him. You see, Moses' automatic reaction would have been to run. But this time he said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Instead of running, he decided to. And his decision to turn wasn't delayed. Well, I'll think about it. Or maybe when God tells me, or maybe somebody give me a word. It says no. In the same way, God doesn't always call out to us. I mean, the bush was burning. He didn't say, Shh. or cat called Moses. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just thought a good word to use. You know, he didn't do anything like that, or whistle or something. He didn't. It was just burning, and it was just there. Until Moses decided for himself, I will not turn. And in verse 4 of, um, of Exodus chapter 3, when Moses made the decision to ten, turn, was when the Lord called. Exactly. Was when the Lord called. So, in closing, children of God, no matter what status we've lost, our authority, always know that God will always be waiting for us. He will meet us even at the back side of the desert. Amen. I reminded of this verse in 1 Peter where it said, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was building. Moses, Noah was building this ark. And at the same time, God was waiting. Although it was only eight people that God saved, God saved, were saved, but God was waiting. In the same way, God was waiting for Moses 
God saw every step of his journey. He knew exactly where he was. And he was waiting for him. He knew his failures. He knew that Moses slayed an Egyptian. He knew all of that. He knew his fears and he knew his struggles. But God still made time for Moses. God did not force Moses to turn. He waited for Moses to make the decision on his own to turn. Sometimes we like to have this remote control in our hands that we press everything like now, now, now. We want instant results. But if God can wait, why can't we? Amen? Why can't we just trust in the process? See, Moses could have easily ran or easily got back into the cave and said, God, I don't, I don't know if you're going to forgive me or so on and so forth. God waited for him. And what did God say? The first thing he said, put off his shoes from off thy feet. Now when we look at shoes, shoes can signify our way of life, how we walked and how we lived. According to our homes and then according to our ways. Ephesians 4 verse 22, in the Amplified Version, it says, strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old, unrenewed self, which characterizes your previous manner of life and, be, and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion. In Moses' case, the shoes on his feet enabled him to run as far as possible from his enemies, from redemption, from anything that he thought he oppressed in his life. But God says, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. In other words, stop running. Stop walking away. I'm here for you. Amen? Amen. So I want to end with this. A reminder for each and every one of us. God's got our back, no matter where we may be in life. Trust him. Let him take care of our situation. Because God's hands are so big. And once we leave things in his hands, he's able to hold them. Our hands are tiny, they're small. And oftentimes we you know we need two hands to hold things. And with those two hands, you know, we try to control the situation and oftentimes we end up becoming frustrated. We end up becoming, you know, and we lose all of that. And it makes us start to second guess ourselves and question our identity. Stuff like that. and all that make us feel weak and feel like, you know, we can never become overcome. But child of God, I want you to know that that burning bush will always be there. Not to judge you, but to sanctify you. Amen? Mm -hmm. To refine you. And that's why, you know, the song we said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We have been redeemed, amen? amen. amen. We have been purchased. Yes. Amen. That's why, you know, when we sing songs like that, it's like, I don't know about you, but my heart just jumps like, man, we were going to be dead, but God saved us. Amen. He's still saving us. Amen. He waits for us. He doesn't put a gun on your head or behind your back and say, not you every now and then, change, change, change. He's waiting for us. Amen? Amen. Not, not saying this to say that we can delay, but say, it's just trust him. Like Taylor prophesied over Job, he's our father. He's our good father. He cares for us. He knows everything that we go through in life. And yet he makes time for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So be blessed. I'm not judging anyone of you in any way, because only God can judge us. Only God is our God. And he's not in a place of judging right now. He's in a place of sanctifying, of redeeming, and bringing us back to himself. Thank you.